Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bernard Firestone. I'm Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Hofstra. Uh, before I turn the program over to Professor Richard, Richard Himmelfarb, uh, I would like to say a few words about Don Sutherland, the man for whom this lecture is named and who donated generously in order for it to occur. Uh, Don was a member of the Hofstra University Board of Trustees, and he was very interested in finding ways to enrich students' academic experience outside the classroom. He suggested the establishment of an annual lecture designed to attract to Hofstra distinguished academics or practitioners in the arts, sciences, and public affairs. Don took a very deep personal interest in the annual lecture. He would have been gratified by the increasing student interest in public affairs and by the array of speakers who visited campus under the Educate 08 and now Define 09 programs. So we owe Mr. Sutherland considerable thanks for moving us in the right direction. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize uh, Mr. Sutherland's daughter, Paige Sutherland, uh, who regularly attends the Sutherland Lecture. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Professor Himmelfarb, who will introduce our speaker. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to give some brief thanks to, uh, to Dr. Firestone, um, to Provost Berliner and President Rabinowitz for all their cooperation in making this possible. Um, I'd also like to thank some of the people from University Affairs, um, in particular, Melissa Connolly, uh, Jamie Cote, and Stuart Vincent for all of their help, and uh, most significantly, of course, the Sutherland family, without whom uh, this would not be possible. It is an honor to introduce Michael Barone. Of our speaker today, no less than the distinguished columnist George F. Will has written, quote, Ask seasoned baseball people to name the best player they ever saw, and you are apt to elicit quizzical looks than this. You must mean other than Willie Mays. Ask seasoned students of American society to list the best writer on the subject, and the response is apt to be a quizzical look than this. You must mean other than Michael Barone. It is difficult to find one label to describe Michael Barone. The Chicago Tribune has perhaps come closest when it writes that he is a mixture of historian, social observer, and numbers cruncher. To be a bit more concrete, Mr. Barone is currently senior writer for US News and World Report and a commentator for Fox News. He is also the principal co-author of the Almanac of American Politics, referred to by many as the Bible of American Politics, and an indispensable compendium of information that is used by both sides of the political spectrum. Mr. Barone is the author of several books, including, most recently, The American Revolution, the remarkable British upheaval that inspired America's founding fathers. He travels extensively and has visited all 50 states and 435 congressional districts, as well as 37 foreign countries. Today, we welcome Michael Barone to Hofstra, to present the Donald J. Sutherland Lecture. Oops. Oh. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Well, thank you very much. It's very nice to be here at Hofstra today, and we've had some stimulating times with some of you already. Um, as, as Rich mentioned, I've been in uh, a number of professions. I started off in law, went to political consulting as a pollster, and then into journalism, and I guess the next, each one of which pays less than the one before, and so now the only place to go is academia. Uh, so here I am today. Uh, in my former uh, life, uh, I, I have been a pollster, and I'd like to take a poll of the audience, if that's all right, um, just to ask you a question. And the question is, uh, what is your favorite cable news network? Uh, and I'd like you to raise your hand if your favorite cable news network is MSNBC. Let's see the hands here. Okay, we've got several fans of Chris Matthews here. Uh, I've known Chris Matthews for more than 30 years, and I have to say one thing for Barack Obama. He is the first male to send a tingle up Chris Matthews' leg. <laughs> uh, 
the uh, CNN. How many were favorite CNN here? Okay, this has got a big CNN audience. You're going to have Anderson Cooper out here, uh, even if the stage is not quite 360. Okay, and Fox News Channel. Let's see, Fox News Channel. Okay, well, I can see that we have a fair and balanced audience here uh, with representation from all sides. Um, you know, I often ask to go on Fox News or to blog at usnews.com on sort of the latest political development of the day, uh, but the opportunity to come here is, gives me an opportunity to try and put uh, what's happening today in a little bit of a longer perspective uh, to get a sense of where we've been going, uh, where we've been, uh, in, in the hopes that that can illuminate uh, to some extent the question of where we're going. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, start off uh, not on the latest development today or what uh, the president said uh, about the stock market on Tuesday, um, but take a look at the 2008 elections first. And those, the 2008 elections, like the elections of 1976 and 1992, uh, have given a, America a Democratic president uh, and a Democratic Congress with large majorities in both houses. Uh, this seems to be a 16-year phenomenon. Uh, 2008, 1992, 1976, also happened in 1960, also happened in 1944. Uh, we have to go back to 1928 where that doesn't work out. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, this, is, um, I'm, this is a phenomenon we've gone through before, and yet this time feels a little different. Um, it is now 44 days since Barack Obama was, in, endorsed, uh, was inaugurated as the 44th President of the United States. Uh, it's also another anniversary. Today is the 76th anniversary of Franklin D. Roosevelt's first full day as president. Uh, he was inaugurated, as was the fashion up to and including that time, in, on March 4th, uh, 1933. Um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to look at the, start off by looking at the 2000 campaign, giving you my take on it, and then looking uh, at today's events uh, and with some... Uh, uh, some, try to give you some sense of where I think we may be heading with the future, uh, and also uh, to look back occasionally before I'm done at uh, that president to whom Barack Obama has been compared, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, whose first full day in the White House was 76 years ago today. Um, the first thing I think to realize about the 2008 presidential election uh, is that the outcome was not foreordained. Um, we've been in a period of what I call open field politics. Uh, there's sometimes a tendency among news commentators to say this had to happen, this was, you know, th it was inevitable that this come about, this would come about. We make predictions fearlessly saying we know what's going to happen. Uh, and yet I think things are often contingent and that that was the case in 2008. Um, I'm reminded of my early days in the polling business when I worked for Peter Hart as political pollster and I wrote an optimistic uh, report about one of our candidates and he said, just remember how it will read the day after the election and your client has lost. Uh, be careful about what you say you know absolutely about the future. Um, I believe in 2008 and uh, today in 2009, we're in a period of what I call open field politics. Uh, and that's quite different from the, what I the period that I call trench warfare politics that prevailed in the years 1995 to 2005. Uh, in that period, we had two presidents uh, born in the first year of the baby boom, 1946, graduating in the high school class of 1964, which was the highest SAT scoring class in history, uh, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. Uh, they both had, in different ways, personal characteristics which people on the other side of the cultural divide just absolutely loathed. Uh, I, 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 you know, you're all familiar with that Bush. Some of you may not have been following that much uh, with Bill Clinton, uh, but nonetheless, I think that's a fair statement. And in that period of trench warfare politics, Americans were polarized along cultural lines, on cultural issues, in line with their personal moral values, uh, and in many cases, religious or quasi-religious beliefs. Um, and in that period, we saw very little variation in, uh, in election returns. It was about a 50-50 nation. I, after the 2000 election, I called it a 49% nation. Um, it was very closely divided, uh, but the numbers did not change very much from election to election. You could pretty well predict the last election from the first one. If you figured the vote was going to change 1%, it would go about that way. And, uh, 
it was a lot of close times. I remember on the 2000 night of the, how many watched election night 2000 here? Okay, well, we've got a good percentage of the political nerds on the campus in here today then. Uh, we've been watching that. Uh, I was working for Fox News on, that was the first time I worked for Fox News on election night, and about uh, 12.45 p.m., noontime, we got the first tranche of exit polls in the key states, and uh, boy, they showed an exceedingly close race in one state after another. Uh, and looking ahead, what was the long, I had a two-word comment of which I will share only the first word with you, which was, oh. <laughs> I thought this is going to be the longest election night ever. Um, it turned out to be, of course, 36 nights. Uh, we had, uh, you know, Britt Hume at one point about 1 o'clock in the morning said to me, well, you know, it may not be till early hours of the morning that we know who's won this election. I said, Britt, we may not know this for three or four days. Uh, it turned out to be 36. Um, but that, we've moved out of that period sometime since. Moral beliefs became kind of delinked with political behavior, and I think we could date it to sometime in 1965 in response to Katrina, in response to Iraq. Uh, voters, some critical quantum of voters, uh, placed a negative judgment on, uh, I think, a negative, not so much on ideology, not so much on ideas, but on competence of George W. Bush. We seem to have lost a great city. We seem to be in the state of losing uh, a foreign war. Um, and so um, we entered this period of open field politics when the voters are moving around, politicians are moving around, you see different coalitions and alignments, you see more voters uh, undecided or moving from one candidate to another, uh, you see unfamiliar issues come up and have uh, uh, responses that, uh, that were not anticipated. Uh, and I think uh, we were definitely in that period uh, during the 2008 election cycle. I believe that we continue to be in that kind of a period today. Um, we certainly saw it in the results in the, uh, you know, 2000, to, in, between the 2000 and 2004 election, only three states changed party in their presidential preference. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 2008 election, we saw 11 states change, 11 Bush states and the second congressional district of Nebraska, which casts a separate electoral vote, uh, all of which had voted for Bush in 04, voted for Barack Obama. Uh, in 2008. Um, when I say that the 2008 election result was not foreordained, um, I say that on the basis that it seemed to me some very unusual things happened in this campaign. Uh, you know, you often hear us commentators saying, well, it's always the case that this happens. Uh, well, we're basing that on a finite number of examples. Uh, you know, we've only had a certain number of these presidential elections. Um, but you know, between 1972 and 2004, you can say in every time when there's been a contested race for the presidential uh, nomination, the candidate who sweeps the primaries wins the nomination. That wasn't true in the case of either party uh, in 2008. Uh, John McCain um, won the Republican nomination by winning very narrow plurality victories in New Hampshire, South Carolina, uh, Florida, and on Super Tuesday. Uh, but the Republicans tend to have winner-take-all delegate allocation rules, uh, and he becomes the party nominee. Switched the votes 3% the other way, away from him and towards Mitt Romney, it would have been a contested race through June, and Romney might have won. Uh, but uh, luck came out on John McCain's side. And McCain had a political strategy, after his first strategy failed, that I never would have advised anybody to employ when I was a political consultant. Uh, his strategy was uh, wait for the other guy's strategy to fail. Uh, in this case, all the other Republicans' uh, strategies failed, uh, and, uh, and McCain became the nominee. On the Democratic side, uh, Hillary Clinton, in primaries, won more votes and more delegates than Barack Obama did. Uh, that's, but Obama won big victories in the caucuses, uh, and with that and the superdelegates, he became the nominee. Uh, you may have read, I was uh, recently a guest at uh, George Will's house uh, for dinner with Barack Obama on uh, January 13th, the week before the inauguration. Uh, and we're not supposed to talk about that, but I will just tell you that uh, I suggested at one point to the president-elect, as he then was, uh, that if Clinton had just con contested the caucuses more actively, she might have been the nominee. Uh, he didn't agree. He said, no, we had a plan all along. and. Uh, this was going to happen. Uh, I still think that it was, uh, it was contingent. It was, uh, it was a very, as the Duke of Wellington said about the Battle of Waterloo, it was a close run thing. 
Um, another in, uh, interesting and unusual thing happened during the campaign. Uh, and I think we're gonna, we may be seeing some of this uh, in the months and years ahead, and that is opinion on major issues shifted. Usually a campaign doesn't take too many months, this one took quite a few, uh, and public opinion doesn't change markedly on, the, on, the, on issues. Um, the different candidates try to emphasize different issues or frame issues differently so that, you know, they'll be on, the, most voters will be on the same side they are, but the issue uh, position, the, the, the voters' preferences basically don't change. Um, but we saw issue, opinion on two major issues change. One was Iraq, on which voters came to appreciate that the surge strategy in Iraq was working. Uh, it didn't get much coverage in much of the mainstream media, uh, but the message did eventually get through. Uh, and basically what had been a big negative for the Republican side became a side issue of less importance. Uh, the other issue was energy. Um, the, um, you know, it was fascinating to me, this is a fascinating exercise in public opinion. When gas prices were $2, $2.50, $3.50 a gallon, uh, voters continued to have the same opinion on oil drilling issues, on whether or not uh, that most voters, Americans, were against oil drilling and offshore uh, in the oceans, they were against oil drilling in the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. Uh, when prices hit $4, opinion shifted. It didn't respond linearly on a straight line, it responded kawoom, the, the line changed on the graph. And uh, voters uh, came to believe the, uh, the argument that was made in sophisticated philosophical terms at the Republican National Convention, the drill baby drill. Um, and uh, as for uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska, uh, opinion shifted to nuke the caribou. Um, this was, uh, actually I read in the Anchorage Daily News that there are 377,000 caribou in Alaska. Uh, more than half, uh, about 600,000 people. And I would suggest that those who are concerned about global warming might want to contemplate the fact that these 377,000 animal, hooved animals with multiple stomachs uh, emitting more than the animal average amount of uh, gases into the air, uh, and that maybe maximizing the number of caribou is not the best thing uh, for those who are concerned about minimizing global warming. Um, in any case, uh, those issues shifted. We had some other developments in the campaign. Uh, the upshot was that we actually had John McCain ahead in the first two weeks in December, despite the huge disadvantages that Republicans had from the low job ratings of President Bush, low job ratings of Republicans in Congress, Democratic advantage in party identification um, that was uh, very different from the 3737 party identification recorded in the 2004 exit poll. Um, the Republicans, for a moment at least, were energized by Sarah Palin, uh, McCain was ahead in almost all the Bush 04 states and was competitive in a lot of Kerry 04 states. The Republican disadvantage in party identification and the generic vote fell uh, from about 10% to 5%. This may have been uh, just a post-convention bounce that might not have been maintained in any cases. It may have been something more lasting. Uh, we don't really know and I don't think we ever will know. Um, but the fact is, uh, because it didn't last, um, we basically, uh, we, the financial meltdown happened. The collapse of Lehman Brothers on September 15th, uh, the coagulation of credit on September, Thursday, September 18th, when Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke and Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson decide that the uh, money is basically going to stop circulating in our financial systems, and uh, they issued their three-page call for a $700 billion uh, federal rescue package bailout, call it what you will. September 18th is the day when you look at the realclearpolitics.com average of the recent polls that Barack Obama overtakes John McCain. Uh, September, the, 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 and, and basically, uh, the voters never look back at that point. And uh, it's also a day, if you check the Dow Jones average on September 18th, it has dropped 40% since that day. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, this is, uh, in that crisis, uh, as you'll recall, McCain kind of flailed about. He said he was suspending his campaign. He was not going to debate at uh, Ole Miss, and he didn't want to debate at Hofstra either. No, I didn't think he said that, but uh, in any case, he was talking about not debating. Uh, Obama uh, really showed kind of unflappability. He seemed cool and collected. 
Uh, when McCain said he had to concentrate fully on the uh, financial crisis, Obama said a president has to do more, focus on more than one issue at once. Pretty reasonable statement. Um, and basically, McCain failed to make, I think, one argument that he could have made on the financial issues, which is that he and the other Republicans had been seeking tighter regulation on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in 2005. Obama and the Democrats opposed it. Uh, Obama was presenting this as a case, well, this was Reagan-era deregulation that caused the financial crisis. Uh, McCain had a counter-argument, which he unaccountably failed to make at that period of time. Uh, in any case, uh, opinion which had been fluid during much of the year uh, became pretty much frozen uh, and was not even be able to uh, change, it was not even changed by the emergence of the political philosopher Joe the Plumber. So, um, the, but looking over the course of the campaign, uh, AP Yahoo did a series of tracking polls of the same individuals. They showed that one out of seven, 14 percent of the voters actually changed their mind during the course of the election. At one point they were for candidate A, definitely. At another point they ended up voting for candidate B. That's a lot more than we had in 2004. Um, the, uh, so uh, I think the lesson is uh, that opinion can shift, uh, that we are dealing, particularly with this financial crisis and the issues it presents, with unfamiliar issues. Uh, on which uh, voters have no fixed reaction because they haven't really faced or thought about these things before and in which many of the politicians have no fixed reaction for the same reason. Um, and that uh, we're dealing uh, with a period when many outcomes are possible. Um, I, and one respect of that is to look at the Barack Obama coalition. Obama won the election by popular vote 53 to 46. That's the same margin rounded off as George H.W. Bush in 1988. Uh, over Michael Dukakis or Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1944 over Thomas V. Dewey. It's a significant but not landslide victory. Um, there were some peculiar facts about his coalition. Um, Democrats talked a lot in the campaign were, were for middle class families, the ordinary person. Uh, but Obama actually amassed a top and bottom coalition. He carried voters under $50,000 income and over $200,000 uh, and lost those in between. Uh, he won big majorities from those who didn't graduate from high school, and those with postgraduate degrees uh, only ran about even with the voters in between on the educational scale. Um, that presents, um, you know, something of a challenge. Voters at the top and the bottom of those scales don't necessarily have the same interests or the same values uh, or the same priorities. So holding them together uh, is, is, uh, presents something of a challenge. Uh, and I think, um, you know, Obama did uh, especially well with voters uh, in the highest, in the high income suburbs, uh, places like Nassau County, which when uh, 20 years ago in 1988 voted heavily for uh, George H.W. Bush, and when George H.W. Bush ran even in the whole New York metropolitan, New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. Uh, the Republican candidate this time, John McCain, got killed got clobbered uh, in, that, in the big metropolitan areas. Uh, I think one of the factors we're seeing is that Republican presidents tend to get punished by affluent voters when they con conspicuously lose wealth. Uh, if you go back to the first George Bush between 1988 and 92, his percentages fell most sharply uh, in, place in, in Southern California and New Hampshire, which also happened to be the areas where housing prices fell most sharply during that period. Uh, obviously, uh, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, we've seen big drops, uh, significant drops in housing prices in metropolitan, major in affluent areas and metropolitan areas, uh, and we have seen um, big drops in, uh, in the value of financial instruments with the stock market collapse. Uh, I mean, uh, I suspect most of the people in this room haven't had the experience that uh, some of us have had when that uh, quarterly, um, 401k report comes in or the monthly brokerage statement, you just leave it sort of unopened for a while. You don't want to open it up and look at the numbers and see how much you've lost uh, in the last month or the last three months. Um, but we saw uh, voters, uh, you know, uh, in the affluent uh, demographic, uh, voting uh, pretty uh, large margins for Barack Obama in many cases in places like Nassau County, New York, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, Fairfax County, Virginia, that sort of place. Um, they won very much. 
the problem for Obama, I think, in this situation is, uh, can he deliver? Are we going to see a revival of wealth in terms of either real estate prices or financial instruments? Well, um, you know, we, we don't know fully the answer to that. As I say, we do know that between September 18th and today, the Dow Jones fell 40%, uh, which is a pretty big drop even by historic terms. Uh, but that's, um, it, it suggests to me that uh, some of the aspects of the Obama program, whether it's higher taxes on high earners uh, or uh, uh, more government provision uh, for um, in health care uh, may not necessarily go over well. It's, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm a little bit surprised that, uh, that he's embraced as much as he has higher taxes on higher earners in a time of recession, since generally speaking, uh, no reputable economist has recommended raising taxes in a time of recession. Herbert Hoover did that in the 1930s, and it didn't work out very well. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Will the affluent demographic stay with Barack Obama and the Democratic Party? Unclear to me. I can imagine uh, answers of both yes or no. Um, the second respect in which the Obama coalition is different is that it is uh, heavily weighted towards the black and the young. Obama won black voters by a vote of 95 to 4. Uh, and black voters, according to the exit poll, accounted for 13% of the electorate this time as compared to 10% in 2004. There's a little error margin around those figures. Uh, don't take them as too much in the way of hard evidence. Uh, but clearly, uh, the Obama campaign uh, did uh, a good job when, you, when I look at the county by county election returns. And of course, I can't imagine anything more fun way to spend an evening. Um, you, can see the, you can see evidence in, 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 in states like Virginia and North Carolina, which were not target states for either campaign in 2004, but were target states in 2008. Uh, you just look at those returns and you can see in some of the rural counties the Obama campaign is bringing out, or perhaps they're coming out spontaneously in part, black voters who've never really voted before, who haven't been, you know, uh, the subject of political organization and so forth. Uh, they very shrewdly found where these people were, uh, got them to vote, and so forth. Um, the question is, will those votes be there for Democrats in the off-year elections in 2009? places like Virginia and New Jersey in 2010. Uh, will they be again in that number for Barack Obama? Uh, we elected the first black president uh, uh, now. Um, I note, then looking back in history, uh, that uh, when John Kennedy was elected the first Catholic president in 1960, he got 78% of the vote from Catholics. Um, Democrats never did as well with Catholics again once the first Catholic president was elected. It went down a little bit in 64, which was a landslide victory for the Democrats. It's been hovering in the 50s or so. Uh, Catholic voters for the Democratic candidates occasionally under 50 uh, ever since. So um, you don't necessarily maintain uh, that level of support in the wake of an historic victory because the victory's been won. And uh, people move on to judge, uh, make judgments based on what are the next things. Um, as for young voters, uh, this is uh, a demographic where Obama did spectacularly well. He won voters under 30 by a 66 to 32 margin, according to the exit poll, better than 2 to 1. Uh, by way of comparison, he carried voters over 30, uh, by my calculation, by a 50 to 49 margin. This was an exceedingly close race, and it obviously suggests in retrospect for my Republican friends uh, the strategy they should have employed to elect John McCain, which is starting a few years ago, pass a constitutional amendment raising the voting age to 35. Uh, that remedy doesn't seem open to them now, and uh, I don't think so. But this is the difference between under 30 and over 30 voters is bigger than anything we've seen since exit polls uh, started measuring these things uh, in 1968 or 72. Uh, and I can't really think of any election in another country, and I haven't followed elections in every country, but I have, you know, followed them, obviously, in, you know, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Mexico, Brazil, a lot of important countries, um, I, where the young voters are that much different from older voters. Um, you know, looking for the, the future for the Republican Party, John McCain carried young voters in only nine states with 57 electoral votes. Uh, if those people keep voting that way, uh, the Republican Party could go the way of the Whigs. Um, this is, um, 
And, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton both attracted young voters to their parties during their presidency. Uh, George W. Bush failed to do so during his presidency, rather the contrary. Obama's attracted them even before becoming president. Um, but the, um, uh, so he's got a tremendous potential. Um, this, this will be, these people will be a larger part of the electorate, uh, but there are also some offsetting factors about them. Uh, young voters uh, were the only age group to give Democratic House candidates a lower percentage than they gave Obama. There's a certain number of Obama Republicans among them. Um, and uh, they did not account, according to the exit poll, for a larger percentage of the vote in 2008 than they did in 2004. Turnout generally was up modestly. It was up among young voters by the same percentage that it was up for everybody else, so it appears. It was up by black voters more than it was for everybody else, among young voters by about the same. Um, when I look at the county returns, I see that Obama and uh, uh, campaign did a terrific job of turning out young voters in college and university towns, uh, in gentrifying neighborhoods in central cities and close-in suburbs. Uh, where these, re these voters are thick on the ground. Uh, I think they also probably did well in getting, getting the votes of 18-year-old uh, high school students in affluent counties, but I haven't been able to test that. Uh, but those voters often are, tend to be transient and lacking in community ties. Uh, and he has, uh, he has raised expectations for them. Uh, can they uh, be motivated to vote for Democratic candidates uh, in elections in which Barack Obama is not on the ballot? Well, the answer is, is, is uh, somewhat unclear. We have fragmentary evidence from special elections, the Georgia Senate runoff and the two Louisiana House runoffs in December, three Virginia House of Delegates special elections in January, special election for Fairfax County Board Chairman uh, in February. Uh, though in all those races, the Democratic turnout, and some of these districts uh, had significant numbers of young and black voters or potential voters. Democratic turnout uh, was dropping off much more than Republican turnoff, and it seems to have dropped off particularly among black and young voters. They were not motivated for whatever reasons to vote in these special elections in anything like the numbers they were motivated to vote for on November 4th, uh, 2008. Um, that suggests to me that Democrats are gonna try and make an effort to get turnout uh, higher than uh, than they got in those special elections in the 2009 uh, and 2010 off-year elections. Uh, it's not clear to me that they'll succeed. Um, some numbers from pollster Scott Rasmussen reports that the Democratic advantage in party identification may uh, be falling slightly, even as Obama uh, gets much higher job ratings than, uh, than, than his party does. Um, and that is a, an element that I think is going to continue to be important. Yesterday's Wall Street Journal had the report of the NBC Wall Street Journal poll uh, that showed very high ratings for Barack Obama, I think 68% job approval, uh, significantly lower ratings for the, many of his programs and policies. Uh, and I think, I think that this is uh, something that we may see more of as time goes on. Uh, I think there's a very good possibility that Obama's going to have very high job ratings in the future. Uh, and my analogy here is to John Kennedy, who also it resembles Obama in some ways. He came into office as a first, the first Catholic president, the first uh, black president. Uh, 63 to 65 percent of white Protestants voted against each of these candidates. Uh, and yet there was a widespread feeling in the country that once they were elected, uh, many people, including many, most people, including many who had not voted for them, uh, wanted them to succeed. And their being a first was some part of it. I think we Americans are ultimately an inclusive people, and the idea of including more people in our definition of Americanness is signaled by our willingness to elect a member of that group as a leader. I think that was strong. Uh, there's other resemblances. Both uh, Kennedy and Obama came to office as young, articulate, physically graceful, uh, charming, uh, a contrast in many ways with uh, predecessors that voters were either tired of or disgusted with. Um, and I think that uh, when you go back and look at Kennedy's job rating, uh, it's always high. Uh, he makes a big a classic mistake, which he admits, like the Bay of Pigs, it goes a little higher. Uh, he's up around almost to 70% uh, all the time during his presidency, with the exception that he goes down among white Southerners when he endorses the Civil Rights Act uh, in June 1963, the act that was ultimately passed in 64 after his death. 
Uh, other than that, he's still riding high at 70% with the rest of the electorate, and pairing is showing him winning uh, by a wide margin for re-election. Uh, the polls in September and, and October 1963. Um, that, that popularity did not actually extend all the way to the Democratic Party. Uh, Democrats got in off your elections of 62, got about the same share of the vote they got in 60. Uh, there wasn't much change. It rose somewhat in 64 after the Kennedy assassinations. Um, but basically, uh, what that tells me is that, uh, is that there was a separation in the Kennedy period between the popularity of the president and the popularity of his party and their policies. And I think that uh, the Wall Street Journal NBC poll is, is just one of several bits of evidence that we have so far that we're seeing the same thing here in this administration. The president is a lot more of uh, part of his policies, a lot more popular than his policies. Uh, and I think uh, there's going to be, uh, that that may continue. Um, the, what we've seen from the Obama administration so far is a president who is somewhat more moderate on at least some foreign and defense policy issues. Uh, and more liberal, even more leftist on domestic policy uh, than I think many people expected, uh, including some uh, articulate voices in the press who were pretty supportive of the people like David Brooks and, and Christopher Buckley, who were identified with conservative causes, were quite enthusiastic about Obama, have both written mea culpa articles during the, the last week. Um, and, uh, you know, I think. Um, you can make exceptions to either of those generalizations, but on foreign policy, he's, he's reappointed Robert Gates as Secretary of Defense. Uh, he said he will keep combat troops in Iraq for 19 months, not 16 months as he promised, uh, and that we'll still have 50,000 troops after that. There's uh, some muttering on the anti-war left and from that part of the left that really wanted to see America defeated uh, at these policies, uh, and he's gotten more complaints about the Iraq uh, plans from Democrats than he has from Republicans. John McCain endorsed them. Nancy Pelosi said she didn't like it entirely. Um, that's an interesting uh, outcome. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not quite what many of us expected. Uh, on domestic issues, I think uh, Obama has, uh, has gone way to the left in many major respects, not all. Uh, and uh, more so than many of his supporters uh, expected, and more so than may be politically sustainable for his party, if not for himself. Um, he acquiesced in the uh, $787 billion stimulus package, which was mostly written by the House Appropriations Committee. Um, after campaigning and saying he didn't want any earmarks, uh, he is now preparing to uh, sign the uh, budget package, the fiscal year appropriations, 09 appropriations, with some 800 earmarks. Um, even while we've got some Democratic senators, uh, Evan Bayh, Russ Feingold, uh, are balking at this. Um, he's, uh, so in that respect, uh, he, is, he has exerted somewhat less in the way of presidential leadership. You know, the old LBJ style, Lyndon Johnson said, you can't change a comma in the bill. He wouldn't let Congress change a comma in the bill he sent to Congress. <laughs> Uh, Obama has gone somewhere towards the other extreme on the stimulus bill, which is I'll accept anything you put in. Um, the, um, we see um, on, the, on the financial rescue package or bailout, the Treasury Secretary um, has yet to lay out the way he's going to get toxic assets out of the bank, which I think is a very difficult policy problem. Um, but we've got, uh, even though we haven't uh, got a pathway, it appears, uh, to solving the financial crisis and getting the banks out of an insolvency position. Um, he's proposed a budget that includes an extra $600 billion for a national health insurance program uh, and some $600 billion for a cap-and-trade system to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And he says he wants all this legislation passed this year. Uh, in order to pay for this, he's going to raise taxes on high earners, uh, even though, the, even though the, if the, economy, the economy may well be in recession when the new 39.6% rate takes place. And uh, he is uh, proposing to reduce for high earners the deductions for mortgage interest and charitable deductions. Now, the latter, I think, is really quite a radical program because basically what you're doing is channeling quite large sums of money away from the voluntary associations that Alexis de Tocqueville way back in the 1830s identified as one of the peculiar strengths of America as a society. 
from charitable nonprofits and so forth, channeling that money away from that and channeling it into government uh, as government revenues. Uh, that will be the benefit of public employee unions, which means it will be the benefit of the Democratic Party. It's not clear to me that that's the benefit of the country, at least I would argue it's not. Others, of course, will disagree. Uh, but it's interesting, we've seen you know, some Democrats in Congress, including House uh, Majority Leader Steny Hoyer and House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Charles Rangel, have both indicated some unease uh, with the proposal to reduce the charitable deduction. And I would suggest to you that if you talk to the President or Development Office here at uh, Hofstra University, you would get an indication that this is probably not their number one favorite tax change, uh, to put it mildly. The, uh, uh, the, the, it, it's, uh, it's fascinating to me that this has been, uh, uh, been recommended. Um, I think that it's not clear. I think that these, uh, some of these policies could cause uh, particular problems. I think one, both cap and trade and health insurance, uh, national health insurance, which Obama is trying to uh, create a national health insurance policy, uh, have uh, faced this problem. That you have regional differences in the economies, the energy production, the healthcare delivery, in different regions of the country that cut across party lines. Uh, and that's going to make it difficult to pass some of these things in Congress. On healthcare, uh, we don't have just one healthcare delivery and one healthcare finance system in the country. We have many different healthcare uh, delivery and finance systems in the country. Uh, and that became apparent to me uh, as I watched the progress, or lack of it, on the Clinton health care bill in 1993-94. Uh, the general feeling at that time, by the way, was this was sure to pass. The Clintons were geniuses. This was going to pass. I remember one of my colleagues at U.S. News came into a meeting and said, they've solved all the problems in writing the bill except the finances. And I thought maybe that might be a problem. I didn't know. But uh, in any case... Uh, they thought, uh, I can remember coming up to New York in 19, uh, early 1994 when the Clinton health care plan was pending before Congress, and I went to uh, interview Governor Mario Cuomo, as he then was, in his office in the World Trade Center Tower, as it then was. Um, and uh, I asked him, among other things, about the Clinton health care bill. He said, the Clinton health care bill, he says, is terrific. It's really good. It's great. They're attacking it. It's fine. They've got to change a couple little things for New York. And he explained what the little things for New York was. Well, I did some more investigation after talking to the governor. And I found out that the little things were not little things. <laughs> they were actually sort of some of the central features of the plan. And that Pat Moynihan, then the senior senator from New York, though he was technically supporting the bill, uh, was very much against it because of what it was doing to the teaching hospitals, the university hospital, medical school hospitals that are very important in New York and will be important in Hofstra's future. Um, and uh, uh, Pat said uh, in his old way, they're, they're destroying the teaching hospitals. He said, that's like burning down the library at Alexandra. Dandria, temples of learning, destruction, uh, and so forth. Um, and then it turned out that not, the bill had, none of the New York Democrats in the House of Representatives were supporting the Clinton health care plan, or ever did. So I started thinking, you know, gee, it's sort of hard to pass things for a Democratic Congress when the Democrats for New York aren't for it. And it ultimately didn't pass. The problem the Clintons faced, it wasn't because they were stupid or foolish people. They were smart people, but the problems they faced were very difficult. And those problems, the Obama people are trying to get around them, but they are still with us, which is that you've got these complicated systems which are different in different places, and uh, not all Democrats have the same interest on these, or not all those Republicans whose votes might be available do. So it's a difficult intellectual task as well as a political task uh, to do this. We see this also on the so-called cap and trade, that basically to basically ask, basically it's a program to ask our, our, our country to spend $600 billion extra a year on electricity. Uh, you know, Obama said, well, nobody's going to get taxed higher under my plan unless you're $250,000 earners. He left off one little thing. Uh, nobody would be taxed higher except people who earn more than $250,000 or people who use electricity. Uh, so. Uh, the fact is that we are imposing, he's proposing to impose a huge cost 
uh, and to make it, it it's delayed, if, you know, calling for not doing it until 2012, but basically uh, imposing this cost on a society which, uh, whose economy right now is in a very difficult condition. Um, and in order to um, a, prevent uh, an environmental disaster that uh, one of our former vice presidents I think is going to strike about 2060, uh, I don't know if that's a good political sell. Uh, and I think, you know, we get different energy provision in different regions. Uh, areas that are going to be most heavily against this are areas that depend heavily on coal for the production of electricity or on manufacturing of products that use carbon. And Detroit News yesterday ran a long article that basically said, uh, cap and trade is economic death to Michigan. Um, now, how are Senator Carl Levin and Debbie Stabenow going to vote on this? It'd be interesting to watch. Um, they, they have not necessarily uh, desire to subordinate the working, uh, the work livelihoods of their constituents for to solve an environmental problem that is, we are told with great emphasis, is definitely going to occur in 2060, even though we don't know the weather for sure next week. Um, you know, uh, we can argue about the public policy or the science behind that, but I think, uh, you know, I think that's a hard political sell. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we look at, it's interesting, on cap and trade, if you, if you measure elites, university elites, media elites, corporate elites, they're all convinced that there's no, um, that, you know, global warming is happening, it's man-made caused, it's going to cause disasters. Uh, if you talk to actual voters, they're split about 45-45 on some of these issues. Look at Scott Rasmussen's polling on the, that issue. Uh, they're not so sure that it's, uh, that it's there. Uh, and I think, um, you know, our, um, our affluent voter is going to go along uh, with significant tax increase, a tax increase that could take the effective federal income tax rate, given the reduction of some deductions, above 40 percent, and tack onto that your 10 percent or so here in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, California. Um, are they going to go along with that? Uh, are people whose livelihoods will be impinged on and will have to pay more for energy going to go along with cap and trade? Uh, it's not clear uh, to me uh, that that's, that's going to happen. Uh, and let me make one more point that has particular relevance to young voters. And I think I'm basing some of this on a book written by an old Democratic friend of mine, Morley Winograd, and a colleague, Michael Heiss, called Millennial Makeover about young voters. Um, as, as Winograd and Heiss basically describe young voters, they say, well, they're pretty confident that government, hey, government can provide health care and clean up the environment, do all sorts of good things. Hey, that's neat. Government pays for it. Uh, on the other hand, it's also a generation that wants choices in their lives. When I grew up, you listened to one of three radio stations, and they had the top 40, and those were the songs you listened to. If you didn't like them, tough. That's what the menu was on offer. Today's generation, you, you folks are listening to your iPods, you have your own playlist, you've got, uh, you're, make, you're creating your own worlds, your own profiles, you're making your own choices. I think there's a real tension between the Obama campaign and appeal, a campaign that used new media, that let people set up their My Obama websites, that let people personalize the campaign. I mean, they had to, somebody at headquarters had to tell, you know, the gal in Houston to take down the Che Guevara poster in their headquarters. But, you know, they, they, and they got a lot of creativity out of these people in the campaigns because these people figured out how to enlist more voters and get more people. It was a real 21st century campaign, far better at that than the Republican efforts this time. Uh, there's a tension between that on the one hand and, I would argue, the mid-20th century welfare state policies that Obama's uh, administration has been proposing, and emphatically in that budget last week. Higher tax rates on higher earners in a recession. Didn't work for Hoover, we'll see about now. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, government-run planned health care. Well, that's nice. Um, but if you're in England, you know, Britain, um, you know, you want a hip, uh, a, a hip replacement, uh, which is a common thing. My brother-in-law's got one here in the United States. Uh, they said the guy who wanted it was too old. He was 57. Boy, that doesn't sound like, you know, one way to save money in health care is called denial of care. You know, it's like the old Soviet system I encountered in Russia in 1989. The cardiac care unit was on the fifth floor, walk-up. 
kept costs down. Uh, you know, the question is, uh, and you know, the cap and trade and extra tax on electricity uh, and all energy production. I wonder uh, whether or not uh, these voters are going to be 66 to 32 in favor of policies uh, that tend to be centralized command and control rather than decentralized networking where you can make your own choice. I don't think the Republicans have succeeded or come anywhere close to presenting a policy framework that speaks to that. Uh, I think it may be possible for them to do so, uh, but I think there really is a tension between my Obama 08 and, you know, the Obama administration 09. Uh, and I think that in some ways they're out of sync with the country. Um, that may all, you know, the financial crisis and everything may have changed that, but that's, that's my opinion. Uh, and I think, let me in conclusion go back to the president that uh, uh, spent his first full day in office 76 years ago today, uh, and Franklin Roosevelt. It's a general impression and it's uh, that, that Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal programs, of which there were several iterations, were highly popular. That's partly true, but not entirely true. And I think there are some lessons that may be of relevance for our time here. Uh, one good source uh, is Amity Schles's book, The Forgotten Man, which is now widely available in paperback, and which I highly recommend, a history of the New Deal. Another source is a book I uh, wrote and was published in 1990 called Our Country, The Shaping of America from Roosevelt to Reagan. That's available for 462 on Amazon, <laughs> used bookstore. Um, and the, uh, uh, but basically, uh, the verdict on the New Deal was a mixed bag. Yeah, Roosevelt was reelected. Democrats did very well in off-year elections in 1934. Roosevelt was reelected by a huge margin in 1936. Democrats held, therefore, big margins in Congress for his first six years in office, from 1932 to 1938. But in 1938, uh, there, you know, the high taxes and uh, tight money policy had set the country in another recession. You had violent strikes and sit-in strikes by labor unions, which had been empowered by the Wagner Act passed by the Roosevelt administration, and th those were unpopular in many places where they took place. Uh, you had. Uh, you know, the, the WPA and other work projects, these were attacked as boondoggling and um, leaf raking and so forth. And uh, Harry Hopkins was quoted as saying, we will tax and tax spend and spend elect and elect. That was unpopular with many voters. Uh, and when you look at the elections results, 38, uh, Democrats lost 81 seats in the House. They lost the majority for New Deal policies because a lot of Democrats from the South and elsewhere weren't New Dealers. Um, they, uh, and they, they lost them primarily in the industrial belt, in the area where the Roosevelt policies were designed to appeal. In fact, they repelled, the statist policies tended to repel people. Uh, the governors of Michigan and Ohio who refused to uh, endure, enforce injunctions against the sit-in strikes, which were clearly illegal, they were defeated for re-election. Uh, Flint, Michigan, Autotown, site of the first sit-in strike, uh, ousted a Democratic congressman for a Republican. Um, those results tended to stay uh, in the 1940 election. Now, um, we it polls in the run-up to the 1940 election, if you go back and look at the polls, Gallup and others, uh, the, the polls indicate pretty clearly that on domestic issues, voters favored the Republicans over the Democrats. They had had enough of the New Deal, or at least there's strong evidence for that proposition. Uh, that kind of increasingly large state turned out not to be so popular with the Americans of the 30s. Well, why did Roosevelt win a four-third term in 1940, you may ask? Well, there was a little something that came along called World War II. Uh, Roosevelt was not a candidate, you know, or said he wasn't. Uh, into uh, at the time that uh, France fell to the Germans in mid-June 1940. The Republicans held their convention the next week. They elected a uh, little-known businessman named Wendell Wilkie. Actually, he was fairly well-known. Uh, as an opponent of the New Deal, but a supporter of aiding Britain and the Allies. Uh, Britain was standing alone at that time against Hitler and Mussolini, who were allied under the Hitler-Stalin pact with, with Soviet Russia. Those totalitarian powers, this is the inspiration for George Orwell's 1984, is this moment in history when it looked like the totalitarian powers could take over the landmass of Eurasia, dominate the larger part of the world and there was not much we could do to stop it. It was a real emergency. And um, 
I think the evidence, you know, Roosevelt went into the Democratic Convention in July 1940 saying he was, sent him a letter to be read by the announcer saying he was not a candidate for re-election. A couple candidates were running, uh, Cordell Hoff, Jim Farley, uh, Paul McNutt, the governor of Indiana. And it was sort of turmoil, and then a voice came up, um, the voice from the sewers. It was a Chicago sewer commissioner speaking from an underground place over a loudspeaker starting the chant, we want Roosevelt, we want Roosevelt. And uh, the convention stampeded and said nominated Roosevelt for a third term. Uh, this was all politically arranged, believe me. Mayor Kelly and the Chicago machine had a lot to do with this. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, Roosevelt won a third term because we were facing a world crisis. He was an experienced leader who had shown great uh, firmness and confidence uh, and had experience in world affairs. The other party was not offering anybody. It was not a New Deal endorsement. It was a war vote. Um, and I think it's important in that connection to remember that uh, it's generally conceded by economists that it was World War II, uh, not the spending of the New Deal, that really got us out of the Depression. Uh, as Amity Schles makes the point, the unemployment rate remained about 15 percent throughout the 1930s and into 1940. Uh, the war uh, suddenly employed a lot more people, defense industries, the military increased uh, to a level of 12 million men uh, at any given time, which in, uh, if we had an arm, a military of that size and proportion in today's America, it would be more than 30 million uh, in the military. That was a huge um, increase in, in Americans at work. Uh, and I think the war also created a mentality that favored large organizations. This was a war that seemed to have been won by big government, big business, big labor. People were proud of having been a small cog in a large organization. It was an era of conformism where you wanted to be an organization man. Uh, the state, the large uh, centralized command and control had great prestige in mid-century America. People were inclined to want a bigger government. Uh, as well as big corporations, uh, because that seemed to be the way that the nation achieved success. I would submit to you, in my judgment, that today's America is different, and particularly today's America as, uh, as, um, as, as experienced by young people is different. Uh, and I think that uh, it is fascinating that the Obama campaign, which did such a wonderful job of of, 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 of working in line with, in tandem with the spirits of our age is now presenting us with a political program that looks like that mid-century program that the Americans of 50 years ago uh, were inclined to uh, support, but I'm not sure Americans are today. Thanks very much. Yeah, Multiple questions. We have time for some questions. Yes. Sure. I think we, I think they're asking you to go to a mic or or they're bringing one to you. Okay. Yeah. Click it and see if it works. Sure. Tell us where you're from. I always like to know where people are from. Hi. Um. Well. Um, I'm from Deer Park, Long Island. Okay. Are there any deer left there? I'm sorry? Are there any deer there? Deer? No. Okay. Um, who did you vote for in the election? Uh, uh, George W. Bush. I voted for John McCain in the okay. D.C. primary where we uh, gave McCain his highest percentage in a primary and there are about 3,000 of us that voted in that, and I voted for McCain in the general election where he lost D.C. by uh, 93 to 6 percent. Um. So you can see I have a powerful influence on my neighbors. Also, are you, um, have you always been a Republican or no. just this time? No, I actually, I went to a high school in Michigan, a place called Cranbrook School in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. I was three years ahead of Mitt Romney there. And we had a straw poll during the 1960 election, and the 19, and, and, and Cranbrook voted 92% for Richard Nixon and 8% for John Kennedy. Well, I, needless to say, I was part of the 8%, just as I was part of the 6% in the district. Uh, it's much more fun to be the beleaguered minority rather than to be part of the conformist, smug majority. And, and it's more intellectually challenging, too. Uh, no, I, 
was talking with some of you over lunch, you know, I mean, wh why did I change or shift to the right over uh, time? I won't dust off Winston Churchill's old chestnut about the head and the heart or something. I would, it, I'd limit it to a couple things, the issues that had big influence on me, although, you know, I, I think about many issues. Number one, um, Detroit. Uh, I grew up in Detroit in the suburbs. I like to say that I'm a, from a humble background. I grew up in a working class neighborhood in Detroit and my father made his living with his hands. Both statements are true. However, we moved to uh, Bloomfield Hills and my father's a surgeon. But anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, yeah, I worked for the mayor of Detroit during the summer of 1967. We had a riot which went on for six, uh, six days and six nights, mostly during the nights. Forty some people were killed. A uh, huge amount of damage was done. Um, you know, I was up there in the police commissioner's office with the mayor of Detroit and the governor of Michigan listening to the radio reports come in uh, as the sun went down. Uh, sometime 9.30, it was daylight savings time and we'd hear the reports. We were abandoning the area between uh, Linwood and Dexter Joy Road and Grant Boulevard. Okay, there's a square mile gone. We're abandoning the area between Liberty and Wyoming, Finkel and Six Mile, another square mile gone and stuff. And that's the way it went for the first hour of the evening until they were abandoning just about everything. Uh, and Detroit's never recovered from that. I mean, Detroit now has a population of half what it did when I was in kindergarten there in 1950. It's got, uh, you know, huge love. It's had huge levels of crime, uh, you know, the, crime, the, the, our system of uh, soft, and term my book, Hard America, Soft America, soft crime, uh, crime control, soft welfare provision proved to be disastrous for central cities. And those of us who had hoped that the liberal policies which I backed in the 1960s would produce something like heaven on earth saw them produce something rather more like hell. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe this government stuff doesn't work so well and maybe there's more to say for markets. Maybe something else works better. Uh, and it's a longer process than that, but you kind of see where my arguments are heading. Uh, the other one was Iran, uh, and here I was kind of unusual. 1979, uh, our diplomats were seized by these, quote, students and, uh, you know, and imprisoned for a year. And my reaction, which was, you know, Jimmy Carter was president, it was not the reaction of his administration, it was not the reaction of many Republicans. My reaction was, that's an act of war. Seizing diplomats is an act of war. Hitler didn't seize diplomats. Stalin didn't seize diplomats. You go, Pat Moynihan at the time said we should bring fire and brimstone to the gates of Tehran. I thought that sounded like the right idea. Uh, you know, that's an act, of, I mean, there's, there's no more fundamental act of war than the seizure of diplomats. Um, and uh, Americans didn't see it that way. That was four years after, you know, the last helicopters had left the embassy in Vietnam. Uh, we tied ribbons around the old oak tree. You know, we we're going to sing songs and the Iranians would let these people, you know, we're going to welcome them home when they're there. We treated these people as victims rather than heroes. Um, and uh, we, you know, uh, Jimmy Carter wanted to send Christmas presents to them. It was going to melt the hearts of the Islamist captors that they were not with their relatives at Christmas. And conservatives were saying a lot of the same things. I mean, I, it was uh, not a partisan thing. And I just thought that was so wrong. And um, that's sort of suggestive how my mind has moved on foreign policy. So, um, you know, 30 years later, we're still dealing with Iran. Uh, President Obama has said that he's going to send people to talk to them, as or talk to them himself. President Bush sent people to talk to him. Predecessors did. Uh, I, we, we don't seem to be getting the picture that it seemed to me was kind of clear in 1979. Somebody up there? Yeah. Hi, I'm from uh, Rhode Island. Um, okay, that's just Michigan and Rhode Island, only two states losing population, so we got something in common. <laughs> um, I wanted to know what you thought about Obama's plan to not even be spending the money for another three years, um, and do you think that his plan is in favor of our like degrading economy, or do you think it's for his own purposes to secure another four years in the presidency? Well, you're saying you're saying his plan not to spend what for three years? Spend, like the bailout plan. All oh, that the stimulus like, package yeah, is not yeah. all front loaded. Well, I think that's part of letting the you know the Congress uh, uh, design the stimulus package to the House Appropriations Committee without adult supervision, and. Uh, 
you know, you have some things in there that are just cheap shots. I mean, the Democrats put the alternative minimum tax fit, uh, fit annual fix in there so they don't have to pay for it under the pay-go rules that they try to impose on budget deliberations. That's not going to be a stimulus. Nobody expects to pay that money anyway because Congress fixes it every year because Democrats need to fix it because the people that get caught of that are people in high tax, high nominal income states like New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, California, Maryland. And those are all Democratic constituencies and it's all these people that are making $140,000 and there's a couple professionals and they're Obama voters and they take all these deductions for state and local taxes and they don't want to get hit with the AMT that doesn't let you do that. So under the pay-go rules, it's hard to do that. So they toss it in the stimulus package. It's not stimulus. It's immediate, but it's not stimulus because everybody, nobody expects to pay the AMT. Um, you know, I think the proposal I would have liked to see there, which the Republicans weren't proposing but some conservatives were, is uh, a payroll tax uh, holiday. Uh, neither the employer nor the employee pays the payroll tax. That works out. That's really fast stimulus. Like, you can do it in the next paycheck. You know, ADP can do this real fast. And uh, you're, stimula you're putting money right into the economy right now, right into people's in pocketbooks of both employers and employees right now, and, and getting their bank balances up and letting them spend more money if they want to or save more if they want to. So, um, you know, is Obama just doing things for re-election? Look. Every politician is some combination of calculation and conviction, and the, the proportions vary. They vary as between politicians, and they vary within politicians from time to time. So, you know, he doesn't do anything with being totally unmindful of the chances of re-election, but I'm sure he does many things where he uh, is willing to risk, uh, take some political risk for re-election in order to seek his convictions. I would argue that, you know, higher taxes on high earners when uh, you got a recession situation perhaps in place is a risk. Uh, he might see it differently, but, uh, you know, he comes from Chicago. He got started in community organizing. Community organizing involves kicking the shins of the big political organization that runs the city government because you know they're always going to be there, and if you just kick them, they, you can get something out of them here and there. Then he decided community organizing wasn't where it was at, and he went into politics. Well, political organization in Chicago consists of kicking in the shins people, the private sector, the bounteous private sector of Chicago, which has always had a wonderful private sector. Uh, you can see it on Rick Santelli and see it at CNBC. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the th assumption there will always be lots of money, so just kick and get out of them whatever you can. Plun you know, you can never plunder too much. And, um, that seems to be the philosophy we're going on, and I worry that we plunder too much. Um, but, you know, my candidate didn't win the election, so I get to criticize on the sidelines. Yes, sir. Yes. You mentioned how there's a disconnect between the Obama plans that are currently in effect and the grassroots campaign. Yeah. And, well, my well, I guess my question is, Many of these campaigns are issue-based, not necessarily around the Obama camp. So, for example, I was at, this past weekend, I was at this event called Power Shift. And uh, called what, I'm sorry? Power Shift, the shirt. Power, Power shirts? Shift, Power Shift. Power Shift, okay, it's, go ahead. It's an issue-based, it's based around the idea of green technology and all that. Okay. The point is that in 2007, there were 3,000 members, 3,000 attendees, and this past weekend, there were 11,000. Wow. And just going based upon that, idea, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be safe to assume that these issue-based initiatives that have been largely been tied towards leftist leanings will develop more as they continue to advocate for whatever policies they are advocating? Well, I think, they, I, I think you're, giving, you know, you're giving at least fragmentary evidence of, of something that's happening out there. I would only add that you know, the left's not the only people that could do this kind of thing. We've just seen a whole bunch of tea parties protesting the stimulus package. And, people connecting by internet and getting together that way. Uh, you know, we saw uh, in, in 2004 the right-wing blogosphere take on Dan Rather in 60 Minutes 2 and get them to, uh, you know, and within 24 hours discrediting this false documents that CBS presented. You know, they, they, they said these documents about Bush and the Texas Air National Guard were produced in 1972. And uh, blogger Charles Johnson showed that they were identical with the uh, documents produced by Microsoft Word with default setting. Bill Gates was in prep school in 1972. So um, 
people from all quarters of the political segment can make a difference or issue concerns and stuff. And I think that's, uh, that's what's happening. You know, things like that are happening around the country in lots of ways. It's one of the reasons I say it's open field politics, because anybody can get in. You don't have to be Queens County Democratic chairman to make a difference. I'll ask this lady up here. Well, I don't think it's necessary, but the <laughs> president does, um, and lots of other people. Uh, well, basically, my understanding is that you have to, uh, we will auction, you're, you're not going to be permitted to emit carbon emission without buying permits, and there will be auctions for the permits, and the administration, Office of Management Budget is estimating that they'll get $600 million, and then there's a trade in permits. Uh, you know, cap and trade. It was actually developed, um, in, as I understand it, in the Carter administration in connection with air pollution control. The original air pollution control laws, as I understand them, and I'm oversimplifying and may get this wrong, so don't take my word utterly for it. The original laws said, this smokestack, you cannot emit anything more than this from this coal-fired electricity plant smokestack and so forth. Cap and trade says, uh, you can emit that if somebody else reduces their emissions, they can sell you that quantum so you can, you can, you can emit more. So it basically says, gives an incentive for people in the marketplace to figure out ways to reduce incentives instead of depending on EPA or somebody to figure it out. Market-oriented, profit-oriented people to figure out how to reduce emissions and then they make money on that. And so this idea is that instead of having a carbon tax, an explicit tax on energy use, whether it's coal, oil, or stuff in proportion to carbon content, which was proposed by Al Gore when he was vice president in 1993, uh, which is the straightforward way to reduce carbon emissions, just tax carbon, and the cost will be added to end products, and uh, people will feel it, and they'll be re re deterred from doing it. You do a cap and trade, which is intended to have the same economic benefits. Uh, I might tell you that, um, if you're thinking about this from a Washington point of view, uh, you might be thinking that how exactly you set up the cap and trade system, what are the terms and conditions, who can do what, buy and sell, <coughs> there's lots of money in setting it up the right way. General Electric is banking on this to make lots and lots of money, so was Enron. They were a cap and trade business. You let me write the cap and trade bill and I won't ever have to worry about money again. Uh, because, uh, you know, Obama and McCain in the last campaign, both all denouncing lobbyists. When you have government, big government, spending lots of money, making decisions which, about which many citizens have strong morally based views on both sides of some issues, uh, people are going to try and lobby you. At least a free people will try to lobby you because uh, they want to influence those decisions. They don't want to just sit there in their living rooms uh, and let people who have been elected make those decisions without their advice. The First Amendment gives us a right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That's lobbying. So if you want big government, um, you, want lo you must have lobbying. Uh, Mr. Rohn, um, I'm Eric. I'm a senior poli sci major from Roslyn, Long Island. Um, and I understand that you've visited every single district in the U.S., something Colbert has been trying to do. But could you perhaps, like, describe that experience? Who's Colbert? Stephen Colbert. Oh, him. <laughs> now, I did The Daily Show with John Stewart, who loved my book, Our First Revolution. On the, he's, he liked me as a history, fan of 17th century history. Did you know that? It's true. Uh, go, you can watch the interview, it's about six minutes on YouTube, and I saw a lot, spiked my sales, it was terrific. Uh, Colbert, what's it like going each day? When I first started writing this All American Politics book, the first one came out about November 1971, uh, when I was 27, and today I would never trust a book written by, like that written by a 27-year-old, but nonetheless, I was happy to do it then. Um, it occurred to me, I was driving across the country, one of two times I've done that, and I said to myself, you know, I'll bet I haven't been to half, I'm writing about each of these districts, and I ha bet I haven't even been to half of them. And I sort of counted it up and got a road atlas and, you know, one of the things I like to do, get a road atlas and draw the boundaries of the congressional districts on all the maps. 
It's really fun. Uh, and, and stuff. And I said, no, I've only been to 210 or something like that. So I started, one of the things I started to do is make a point that when I traveled, I would go to, you know, all the districts in a metro area. Sometimes it's just kind of cheating, you know, you go over the LBJ Expressway in Dallas and set foot in a parking lot on the other side. I kind of cheat, you get all the way to Wichita Falls. That was kind of che che chintzy. Uh, but it also means that you get to all parts of a metro area. You just don't go to the Beverly Hills Hotel like some political reporters I know uh, and try and sit there and have a drink. You, you drive all over the LA Basin and you learn things. Um, and you observe things and stuff. Uh, and, you know, I just try to put into, you know, the political demographics, the, or the political numbers, the demographic numbers, uh, and, you know, just the physical ambiance, the kind of people there, the kind of people you encounter, how they behave in everyday interchanges and stuff like that. So, you know, it's an interesting country, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's a finite number. It's only 435 districts, so it's a finite number. I mean, you know, it's, it, it, you know, on election night on Fox, I've been doing the, uh, you know, county election returns, and I, you know, build commentary suggesting where the election outcome may be headed based on the returns we, we have from specific counties because I'm aware of, you know, their past electoral behavior, their demographic character, whether they've had recent growth or decline, uh, stuff like that. I mean, I just know that stuff. Uh, there's only 3,141 counties, so it's not hard to keep up. Yeah, this gentleman. Good afternoon. Um, my question is... Uh, You're from Massachusetts, right? We're from Massachusetts. Preasy with meeting. Okay, this is... Let the record show. Uh, <laughs> many, many of our politicians and the general consensus is that uh, the, economic, uh, the economic climate we're experiencing now is the worst since the Great Depression. Um, I'd, I'd just like to get your opinion on how this recession compares to not the Great Depression, but the economic climate of the late 1970s and the Carter administration. And, the, and how, you, how you would comment on how, um, like you said, how tax cuts have been overwhelmingly um, revered as not being able to work. What, what will work um, in the minds of our politicians is larger government, um, sort of anti-Kemp Roth type uh, legislation, which are sweeping tax cuts, um, a tighter monetary policy, uh, restricting, restricting the Fed's power. Uh, how would you compare these two eras, and how would you compare the, um, the solutions that are proposed to the two eras? Well, as, as I understand it, and you're getting me beyond the areas of my expertise uh, to the 3,142nd county or something, but the, uh, um, the, you know, this particular economic downturn has largely been uh, triggered or is closely related to uh, a financial problem, insolvency of banks and the pollution of banks' balance sheets by large numbers of toxic assets, to which there is no equivalent even closely in the post-World War II recessions. That's my understanding. So that is different. It's different in a second way in that we have had, or it has been perceived by Ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan that we've had a threat of deflation. So you know, deflation hit Japan in the 1990s, the U.S. and the ninth, some other countries in the 1930s. It's very hard to get out of deflation. People just stop spending and, you know, money's going to be worth more next year, so just hold on to it and do nothing. It's good for mattress sales, not good for the economy. And the, um, so it's not good for economic growth. So it's different in that respect. I mean, the late uh, you know, the, the Carter thing, we had, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter eventually appointed Paul Volcker to head the Federal Reserve, who promptly raised interest rates a whole lot in order to reduce inflation. We're not sitting here with an inflation problem now. We've hugely inflated the money supply because the velocity of money is so slow. Uh, it hasn't uh, increased uh, nominal economic output very much at all, rather the contrary. So, you know, it may, we may bring out and have a huge fling of inflation sometime in the future. Uh, but we've got a problem now like deflation. If you go back to the 01, you know, 02, 05 period when Greenspan, as chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, held interest rates down for a long time, I think he did so. Uh, he's attacked for doing that by the Wall Street Journal editorial page, by some on the left, some on the right, uh, for letting a housing bubble go on by keeping interest rates too low. I think he was concerned about deflation 
Uh, ben Bernanke was then a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve and I think in 2002 published a paper on deflation where he sets out some of the things you can do beyond reducing interest rates to zero uh, to fight deflation. And the Fed under Bernanke is now doing some, of the, some or all of those things uh, as well as putting rates down to zero. So our problem right now is not that money is becoming worthless but that it's becoming worth more and we really don't want that to happen. And, or at least that's been the decision. Now, you know, subsequent economic historians may look back and say, gee, they overrated the risk of, uh, of deflation. First in the 0205 period and then in the 0809 period. Maybe that's what they're going to end up with. I, you know, I don't have a professionally based opinion on that. I'm just another moderately well-informed citizen when it comes to forming that opinion.